case of the morning is zone case 28 of 2022 for 263 Emerson Street. And I am recusing on this matter, so I will turn it over to Mr. Richardson and Ms. Burton Falk for the hearing. Thank you, Alice. Um, do we have an applicant? Hi, this is Hello. Adria Zawicki with PWWG Architects. Hello, um, I need to swear you in. Is, do you have anybody else that's going to testify today? Uh, yes, uh, Caroline West is gonna to testify today as well. Okay, is she in the meeting? I haven't seen her name. Okay, I believe, I believe she was going to get on. Um, is she in the waiting room? She's on the panelists list. She just needs to unmute. Okay. Ms. West, are you there? Yes, I am. I had okay. to be upgraded to panelist. All righty. Um, let me swear you in and then we'll start the hearing. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. Okay. Um, has the case case has already been read in then? I read in the case. Um, okay. This is zone case 28 of 2022 for 263 Emerson Street. The applications for interior renovations to convert a structure into a two unit dwelling with a two car integral garage at front, two surface parking spaces at rear, and a second floor deck. They're requesting a variance from 911.02. Two unit residential use and single unit attached residential zoning district is prohibited a variance from 925.06.g.1.b to allow the use of parking in a front setback, and a variance from 925.06.a.14.1 uh, to allow a porch in a front setback. Okay, who would like to start for the applicant? I'll start. So I'm Major Zawicki with PWWG Architects, and um, this is for 263 Emerson. You can see on the right-hand side, the project location. It's about a block or so off of Alder and Shady Avenue. If you could go to the next slide. So the first one that we were gonna talk about is for the two unit residential use in the single attached zoning district. As you can see on the, in the zoning map on the left, uh, our property is highlighted in yellow. It borders a multi-unit high density residential district on two sides. And then on the other two sides highlighted in red are other multi-unit properties. And then highlighted in orange is a single family attached property. And it's worth pointing this out because as you can see from the photos, two properties attached and one property that has two units read exactly the same from a street level. Um, it's a precedent in both the, in, in the direct vicinity of this property and this functioning as a two unit, we don't think would have a negative impact on the feel of the street. And then if you could go to the next slide, I'm gonna pass this one off to Caroline. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, uh, attached is a uh, shown as an affidavit from the former over owner, uh, Sal De Simone, uh, who lived in the property from 1943 to 2015, uh, and attested uh, that that uh, the unit the the building actually had three units in it, um, and still has uh, maintains two units with the rear entry for the, the, uh, the, back, the back portion, the back unit. Um, and that was his, um, that was his uh, affidavit as to the use of the building, uh, you know, when he lived there and what he, what he knew about it. And, uh, and as noted, uh, the, there is uh, still indicia of the multifamily use uh, on the building. What are, what are those indicia? Can you be more specific? Uh, the, the, uh, the, there is a, a back, 
the second unit is that back addition off the building uh, with the doorbell for that rear unit. How are the utilities set up? Are they se separated? Uh, you... Not a, not any longer, no. What do you mean by not any longer? Were they at one Maybe time? The, and... at, at one point, they, that's something I don't know about. I don't know when they were, but since we've owned it, it's been one uh, okay. one utility. When did you acquire the property? Uh, 2015. Okay. And it's and been... When, when you acquired it, how many units was it set up for? Uh, and when we acquired it, it was set up for it. He, it was a, he, it was set up for one unit, although uh, it has now been, you know, it's been vacant. How long has it been vacant for? Uh, since he moved out in 2015. Okay. So was it vacant when you acquired it? No, he lived in it. Okay. And, but you have had no tenants or you have not lived in it? No, since. we have not. We have been uh basically uh waiting to be able to de determine what to do with it to clean it up to make it a part of the fabric of the community again uh he and his um wife both elderly um i've known them all of my life uh actually he taught my father how to weld uh and they were in bad shape and we bought the property from them so that they would be able to go somewhere where they would be able to function uh, as his wife's in a wheelchair. And uh, since then, we have basically been holding on to it so that we could uh, eventually develop it into a property that would be respectful and look good in the community. I see. Do you know how long Mr. Simone and his wife were using the property as a one unit? I do not. Okay. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, I guess we can go on to the next slide. I'll take it from there. So in order to accomplish this project, we have two small encroachments on the neighboring properties. So these are two, two letters of approval from the neighbors uh, at the St. Jude's Parish to the south of us, and then at 261 Emerson, saying that they understand that we have these small encroachments and that they're okay with it. Uh, the one from the parish is because the parking pad to the rear just sits on the setback. And then the one from 263 Emerson is we have a deck that um, is a little bit above the, above the side yard setback with them. And then uh, do you, I guess you can go to the next one. All right, the second, um, the second variance that we're requesting is for a parking garage for two cars on the front yard setback. And part of what we're doing with this project is looking to rebuild the existing front porch in the exact location. Um, we're going to lower the basement a little bit just to be able to accommodate the parking underneath, but otherwise we're rebuilding the porch in the same footprint that it sits at right now. We're not looking to expand the size any. Um, the proposed elevation of what we're looking to do is in the center on the bottom. And I think it's worth noting that as of right now, parking is not allowed on this side of the street. So the curb cut that we're looking to do isn't gonna eliminate any spaces, but, but what it is gonna do is allow us to provide four, four parking spaces, the two in the garage and the two in the rear, all within this property, which should help alleviate some of the parking concerns that may be, may be with, um, Maybe brought up with this being a multi-unit, multi-unit property. Uh, and then, can you go to the last slide, please? Uh, and then this is for the front porch being within the setback. So it's very similar to what we just discussed. We're just looking to to rebuild that existing porch and the exact same footprint. Uh, so the feel and character that it has, well, hopefully we'll have a little bit nicer of a character, but the feel, the scale that it has right now is what is what we're looking to do when we rebuild it. Are you saying that you're not seeking to come any closer to the street than the house already sits? Correct. Okay. And and that's it for, for uh, yeah, the three I have a quick question about the parking. Could we go yeah. back to the previous slide? 
I'm just trying to envision how this would work. So, so you're proposing one driveway and one curb cut and having two cars oh, pull okay. into a semi, what, like a somewhat undergroundish garage and then two in the backyard. Is that what you said? Yes. Well, so how would that work? Can you show me? So we're the parking to the rear is just off of Swoop Street, the alley, uh, and that's just going to be a surface, a surface spot or sorry, two surface spots. Okay, so, so that would be access from Swoop Street yeah. not to the front? Okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. And then the parking in the front, it's just going to be a, a tandem garage. So one car is going to be parking in front of the other. And the the property, the, the first floor already sits up off of the ground several feet. So we're, we would just excavate, I think it's only like maybe two feet. You would drive down maybe two feet into the garage level. Um, from from the street right now. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Do you have anything else you'd like to present? Uh, that I believe that's it. Okay. Um, any other evidence from the applicant, Ms. West? I have nothing further. Okay. Do we have anybody else that was seeking to participate in this hearing in the waiting room? Yes. We have two hands. Okay, why don't we let them in? I'll swear them in. Okay, I see uh, Jeremy Resnick. Who else do we have? Kelby. Uh, I'm sorry? This is Sean Kelly. Okay. Um, I need to swear you in before you testify, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Okay. Why don't we start with Mr. Resnick? Um, First, yeah. state your name and tell us where you live. My name is Jeremy Resnick. In the property. Sure. My name is Jeremy Resnick. I live at 246 Emerson Street. It's about 50 feet, 100 feet from the property, something like that. On the opposite side? On the opposite side. Okay. Yeah, just um, there hasn't been any community process. So um, we'd really appreciate an opportunity to sit down with the owner, understand more about this. This hasn't been a multifamily property for many years. Um, as she's already described to you. Um, there are no curb cuts on that side of the street. Um, having a garage in the front is not in character with the neighborhood. And uh, I mean, we're opposed until there's some community process. Are you affiliated with, any, with the um, local CDC or just an interested neighbor or both? Just an interested neighbor. Okay. Um, is that all you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, we think it's kind of dangerous. People aren't used to, people have a lot of kids going up and down the street on that side. Um, that garage is very close, as it's designed, is very close to the sidewalk. So people are going to be coming out of that garage blind. Um, so we're concerned about the safety of kids in the neighborhood with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, who's next? Hi, I'm Sean Kelly. So, Go ahead, Mr. Sure Kelly. Tell us where you live and what your interest is in the property first, please. Uh, I live currently uh, 234 Emerson Street, just down the road. However, um, I plan to move into 262 Emerson Street, which is directly across the block from okay. 263. Um, I've been a neighbor since 2003. I've lived in the neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, I have a concern. This is the first time I've, I've had the opportunity to see a front view of this property. Uh, you know, my, my primary concern is about the, the garage and its impact on the neighborhood. Uh, you know, this house as it sits is not, uh, you know, is not in a condition that, uh, that I find particularly uh, attractive, but I think that 
looking out the front window of my, you know, my living room at the new house, uh, seeing a garage door is, um, is something that I, that I really question. Do you have any knowledge or information as to um, the, the multi unit use of this building? Have you, have you ever known it to be a multi unit or a single family or um, at least on it? as of 2003, when I moved in, uh, my understanding is that this is always a single family home. Um, now, I understand that most of the houses in the neighborhood during the Great Depression took in, uh, you know, either either tenants in rooms or split up into apartments. So, like, I, I have no doubt that it that it was an apartment, um, multi unit at some point in the past. But to my understanding, as one of the neighbors, that that family lived there for a very long time as a single family. Okay. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, thanks. I, you know, I, okay. I, I appreciate the chance to speak. Sure. Um, we'll throw it back to the applicant just very briefly if you want to respond to anything you heard, and then we're going to close the hearing. Uh, we definitely, we definitely appreciate the concerns regarding the parking. Um, I think they're they're valid and it's definitely something we can take a look at see if we can find a way to uh, incorporate it so it's safe and uh, in keeping with the character. And uh, Caroline, did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Yeah. So we're gonna close the hearing. We have 45 days, but we'll keep the record open. We have 45 days to make our decision. We will wait um, until the 45th day to issue our decision. In the interim, I would encourage uh, the owner and the applicant to meet with Mr. Resnick and any other interested neighbors and talk about the project. Um, and you can, if, if any changes are proposed or any agreements are reached, you can submit those to us in writing and we'll consider them as well. Um, but we'll hold our decision for the full 45 days to allow some time for you to, to meet and talk about the project. Otherwise, we'll, we'll issue our ruling on day 45. Is that, a, is that understood? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, that concludes the hearing. We'll keep the record open in case you want to submit any additional information, um, but that concludes the hearing for today. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Richardson. Mo moving on to the next hearing for the morning. Uh, it's zone case 21 of 2022 for Cliff Street, parcel M143, 146, and 147. Uh, the applicant is identified as Nathan Huggins on behalf of the Housing Authority for the City of Pittsburgh. Do we have Mr. Huggins? Yes, I'm here. And Mr. Huggins, are there others that you anticipate um, will be testifying with you? No, I believe it's just me. All right. And do you swear or affirm that the information that you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And Daniel, could you read the case in, please? This is zone case 21 of 2022 for Cliff Street parcels 9M143, 146, and 147. The application is for the new construction of three single unit attached dwellings. They're requesting variances for 903.03.c.2. Minimum front setback is 25 feet, 19 feet is requested, and minimum interior side setback is 10 feet, and five feet is requested. Okay. So, Mr. Evans, we, we can put your materials up. So, can you explain first where the property is before we get to the site plan? Is there? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um, this, this site is actually part of a group of sites throughout the Hills District. Um, this sets on Cliff Street. Right there, it's a shaded area on the, on this map you see in front of you. It's halfway between the Cassatt Street and Ludley Street. Do you have a, an aerial view or any street view? Do you have a photo of your posted notice? I mean, something Yeah, it's, of... um, I think, probably it's number four or five on the slides, I believe. You go to, I think it might be number five. There we go. That, it, it just helps us to have the context. So the orange notice is on the vacant land where what, yeah. now we'll, we can go back to the site plan, what you're proposing to do. 
Yeah, that, that sits in the middle of those three existing lots that we're, we're proposing to put those uh, th three uh, single attached units on. So, okay. Um, like I said, this, this project is um, part of, you know, we have eight sites throughout the Hill District for uh, single family housing. Um, there's three existing vacant lots there on Cliff Street. Um, we're proposing to put three, uh, you know, single family attached uh, units on. Um, this zone, this is a setting in the RM M zone, multifamily zone. Um, we are, are, are looking to uh, build these houses on, the, on these lots. This, the the uh, Armani group was, was looking to, to uh, build up this area a little bit on these vacant lots to, to bring some affordable housing within the community. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a, you can zoom in there a little bit if you can. This, uh, these three lots are pretty narrow um, existing and they're around 20 feet a piece width wise. Um, when you, with the setbacks that are required, it doesn't leave hardly any building envelope left. To place place a unit. Can I can I ask a question here? Are they yes. when you say they're um, attached? So the variances being requested are not for the interior sides that would be attached, but for the exterior on the yeah. on the ends essentially. Well, I, I sent a uh, my email back with the, my stuff for the hearing. I think the variances that was on that was 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 wrong we were requesting a 19 foot front set back a 15 foot rear and a five foot exterior side back the interior is going to be you know zero because they're attached well that's it that's what i'm trying to understand is I, I, you said the exterior side but it's really interior to your site right i mean there, there are parcels on either side the the, so, uh, the in the interior to our, the exterior to the neighboring property we're requesting five Okay, it's still an, in, it, according yes. to the code, that's still an interior yeah. property line, but it's if exterior to the there structure yes. that you're proposing. Yes, correct. correct. And, and are you proposing a five foot setback on each of the outer sides for the for the units? Yes, yes. The, uh, if you go to uh, two slides down, number four, you can see the building setting on there. And then we have, the, you can see the five foot setback to the neighboring property on both sides. And I think in the, the one photo there, we saw a structure on one side, but um, what's, and it looks like there's a significant setback on the other side. Yeah, you, there's a structure setting on the, the east side of the site. You can see it there, it, it, it's on two lots. You got a big, big gap between our lot and theirs. And then the neighboring on the west side there, you can see um, it sets almost on the existing line. It's up on the front. You can see so, that too. can we get to the the um, the nineteen foot um, front yard setback being proposed? It looks yes. like the structure on the the left side of this drawing um, is to the property line. But Correct. how did you determine the proposal for a nineteen foot setback? If we're able to get a uh, on site parking spot in front of the garage unit. They give us enough room to get a, a car placed within the property, and it lines up with the neighboring property set back on the. Uh, on the that, right that's side. what I was going to ask. Does yeah. the 19 foot line up with the um, part the attached structure on the other side? Yes, yes, it's pretty pretty much uh, right in line with with that existing unit over there. So as is. Okay. And are there? Um, do, Recognize we're seeing the context of this site, but on the opposite side of Cliff Street, it looks like there may be structures or um, are those structures or are those driveways on the opposite side of Cliff Street? Yeah, those are the other sites that as part of this master has been clipped out, but um, that's, those are the driveways to this. I think those are two single units setting across street that we are updating as you know the master plan of this but, area that we're but just the, in the context of the streetscape um would your three parcels and the neighboring parcels be the only ones with the 19 foot setback or are there others along the street that are 
as closer, closer to the street. Well, what one, the ones that we're proposing? No, I meant uh, just in the neighborhood generally. I'm seeing uh, yeah, in, in the neighborhood, like the neighboring property to the right is about 19 feet, like, like we discussed here. The one to our left is on the street. Um, <clears throat> on down Cliff Street, uh, if you come up Cassatt and you go left, I don't have a photo of it. But there's a row of um, attached units. They look like, look to be, I didn't, don't have a measurement um, in, in that range, 19 to 20 feet um, off of the sidewalk as well. I wonder if you could supplement the record with um, some sort of streetscape photos that would help us appreciate that. Yeah, I have a couple of, uh, if you get to the last slide. Oh, there we go. There, I have the, the whole 1967 historical map there on the top right, which shows buildings attached and basically setting on the street. Um, and then on the one that is pretty much like what we are proposing is on Arsena Street, which is kind of at the back, right behind our site to the right. Um, I'll put a star, it's a lower left-hand corner picture. If you see the star, that's where our site would set behind that red, the red house. Uh -huh. There's a three, three, single attached units there, but they, they're up on the street. And uh, if you look at the fencing, I'm assuming that's the property line. They, they were within probably, you know, five feet of, of the property line. Okay. The so, it's, well. so it's not a um, general condition that all the other houses on the street would meet the 25 foot setback. They're, they're varying front setbacks. Yeah, it varies throughout the, throughout that okay. street. Some, some are on, some are off. Um, okay. I didn't have any other questions. Uh, Ms. Burton Falk or Mr. Richardson, are there any questions of this applicant? No questions, Madam Chair. No questions. All right. Uh, did we have others who would like to participate in this hearing? No, Madam Chair. Anybody raising their hand? I'm not seeing it. All right. Mr. Huggins, thank you for your explanation. I think that um, I think we understand what's being requested. Okay, thanks for the time. All right, all right. We're gonna close the hearing for the day and then move on to the next, which is uh, zone case 35 of 2022 for um, 254 40th Street, parcel 49K61. Um, the applicant is identified as Eric Brightman and the owner is the city of Pittsburgh. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, Mr. Brightman, can you just pause for a second? Do you have others who are intending to testify with you this morning? Um, Andrea Ketzel, um, who is with the city of Pittsburgh. Um, okay. I just want to make sure that we have everybody who's supposed to be in the room in the room. Sure. Of course. And, uh, can I ask you both to unmute for a moment and do each of you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. All right, so Daniel, could you read the case in please? This is case 35 of 2022 for 254 40th Street, parcel 49K61. The applications for the renovation of City Park, uh, they're requesting a variance from 912.04.E. Maximum height of accessory structure permitted is 15 feet and 22 feet is proposed. All right, Mr. Brightman, are you starting? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for uh, accommodating us this morning. Um, we have been hired by the city of Pittsburgh uh, to um, develop construction drawings for the first phase of Arsenal Park uh, in the Lawrenceville neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. Um, here we are in the context of the park um, in Lawrenceville, um, bounded by uh, 40th Street um, and 39th Street. Um, and although the park extends from Penn Avenue over to the Arsenal Middle School, um, our focus for the first phase is the highlighted area, which is uh, the existing uh, ball field. Uh, there are some, I believe, a basketball court and some other paved courts along the 39th Street side. Um, there, I have some existing photos uh, in, in a few slides up. Next slide, please. Um, so here are our um, 
carry notification signs um, installed uh, sometime early January. You can tell. I was going to say snow. <laughs> it was a snowy day. All right. It, it, it was a technical install. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just to kind of give some zoning context showing the adjacent um, um, uh, zoning. This is pulled right from the, uh, the website, um, more for information. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here are some existing uh, photographs of the kind of the core of um, um, our scope. Um, the existing ball field, you can see. Um, the existing playground, which currently exists um, in the mall space, which is kind of that connect that pavement connector from 40th Street to 39th Street, um, we are proposing to kind of take that playground area and kind of focus it on the uh, field space where there's there's more room to kind of integrate um, multiple age groups. And I have to say, I'm delighted to to see the plans for the park, but we have one request here, which is to have an accessory structure within the park that is um, beyond the 15 foot height limitation. So I'm curious as to what type of accessory structure um, is proposed to be 22 feet high. We're almost there. Okay, let's, uh, let's move along here. Next slide. Uh, so this is kind of our scope as a whole, looking at um, getting pedestrians um, in from 40, 40th Street and 39th Street in the way of um, repaving some of the existing paths to make them accessible, uh, which would be from 40th Street and then from 39th Street, um, getting pedestrians in um, without handrails and ramps uh, and an accessible route um, via uh, some changes in grade, uh, penetration in the existing wall, and some reconfiguring of the paths to get um, a better flow from, um, um, uh, from 39th Street. Um, the next slide, we'll get to the core of the playground here. Um, so we, we have worked with the community. Um, this is um, dating back last year, I think maybe even late 2019. Uh, we've, we've hosted um, several um, open table um, kind of discussions with the community at uh, farmer's markets to help hone in on the, the play equipment uh, the play uses um, and just kind of the activities that the neighborhood uh, wanted to see here. Um, so at the top of the screen, we are proposing a restroom structure um, uh, with a, a, this is shown as a, a trellis, but we're, um, um, that will be a covered roof uh, with picnic tables. Um, that is not the accessory structure, but just to kind of give you a global context here. Um, the playground um, is separated by a, a, a a path um, that, that has a gentle undulation up about three or four feet, separates the two to five space, which is on the right-hand side, and the five to 12 space on the left-hand side. Um, included in the scope of the playground is a spray feature, which is shown in the light blue uh, circle closest to the restroom building, um, as well as rain gardens um, and some kind of woodland paths and planting uh, to provide a variety of, of, of play and uh, settings. Um, um, for users. So um, the structure uh, that we are asking for um, a variance is uh, circled in red. And the next slide um, will show the structure <clears throat> specifically. Uh, it is a custom piece um, built by Compan. Um, who, they make some very interesting and um, um, playful pieces um, kind of hitting all- What the all heck is it, Mr. Bright? <laughs> It's a climbing structure. Uh, it's a sliding structure, uh, and it allows people to kind of uh, get up to a uh, higher elevation uh, in order to, you know, the difficulty to climb up the rope into the structure. Um, so we're, 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 we, we know the variance. We're proposing a 22 foot high piece, um, but this piece will allow for um, a wide range of play values that helps with motor skills, agility, balance, and coordination, which has been shown to be beneficial, uh, to be beneficial in early childhood development. I um, want to so know which kid at a farmer's market said, I want to climb up as high as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> I'm curious as to whether um, the height is measured um, by the, the, the more 
it looks more the structural spires. pieces and then there are some projections above which which is the the height that's being proposed it's to the 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 i guess the spires as they continue up so that is that is measured to the top of the piece but the actual um we'll say roof of the structure um is you know probably about 16 feet so arguably if if those um spire pieces were not counted into the height it would be 16 feet not 22 feet yeah and i could get a i could get a specific measurement on that uh, no I, I was going to say i think we understand it generally um but the typically when we see accessory structures the request for additional height is to allow for a second story or for a second residential unit um this is a a limited uh, piece that is designed for the community. It's within the interior of the site. Um, you said that there were undulations of the topography. Is there, um, it, does that sort of uh, minimize the height of the structure just because of the, the varying topography? Um, not necessarily, they're unrelated. Um, okay. the, the change in topography is just to allow different vantage points from the ground plane and then allowing the incorporation of uh, embankment activities um, into that. But, but in terms of visibility, I mean, um, you might be able to see it within the park, but yeah. um, from, from other vantage points outside the park, you're less likely to see it. Yes, and you, it, the next, I think the next two slides show some perspective renderings um, that, that kind of show those different vantage points looking into the playground from, from outside. It will be attractive to the kids who want to climb on it, but and noticeable, but uh, maybe not if you're driving by. <laughs> Correct. Okay. And are there are there any other features within the park that would um, be of comparable height or this is this is this is the one that would be the highest? This would be the highest. Okay. Okay. I didn't have any other questions. Um, Ms. Ketzel, did you have anything you wanted to add for the on behalf of the city? Uh, I do not. We uh, I think Eric did a good job of covering it. Okay. Thank you. And um, Mr. Richardson or Ms. Burton Falk, um, any questions of the applicant? No additional questions, Madam Chair. Okay. No questions. It looks like an interesting project. But thank you. We're 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 really excited about this. I think this is uh, we're we're so close with this. <laughs> <laughs> Except you have an accessory structure that exceeds the fifteen foot height limitation. Yes. <laughs> We will uh, we will consider the application and issue a decision as quick as within the time frames permitted under the code. All right, thank you for being thank here you. this morning. Thank you very much. All right, we're we're going to move on uh, to the next case for the morning, um, which is Zone Case Thirty of twenty twenty two for um, twelve twenty eight North Sheridan Avenue. Um, the applicant is Alan Dunn on behalf of the owners, uh, Jonathan Elmer and David Mislin. Who, who do we have attending here? Mr. Elmer, Mr. Mislin. And we have Alan Dunn. So if you, I could ask each of you to unmute and be sworn in for the record, please. Do, do we have Mr. Dunn too? I'm just I'm just trying to I see believe. who we've got. All right. Um, do each of you? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, right? Robert. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. This, sorry. This is uh, Robert Burnett. I believe Mr. Dunn is trying to join us. Okay. So, um, I, I'm on now. Actually. I'm with uh, Dunn and Associates as well. We, we, all right. So we've got two architects and two owners, but I'd ask you if you would each swear or affirm that the information you provide to the board is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. And um, as you're speaking, if you could identify yourself for the court reporter, that would be appreciated. And Daniel, could you read the case in, please? This is case 30 of 2022 for 1228 North Sheridan Avenue. The application is to enclose a residential porch, and they're requesting a variance from 903.03.b.2 
30 foot front setback is required and 29.5 feet is requested. Oh, good heavens. You couldn't find six inches there. Okay. Um, who's going to start for the applicant? I will, Alan Dunn. Thank you. We have your um, materials up, Mr. Dunn. So if you could explain what's being proposed here. Well, actually, that is not the subject property. That's one uh, across the street. These are images of homes in the immediate proximity that had enclosed porches. We thought we, we thought turn we would on. include them as a reference. Could could you um, turn us to a page that does depict the subject property? Yeah, yeah. If we could back up a little bit. Daniel, you have it back a couple. Is there a photo? Yeah. Okay. There. Okay. Whoops. 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 There. Yeah. Okay. There. Yeah, you can see the, the post notice in the front. Um, so, yeah, the intent is to uh, enclose the porch, but preserve probably uh, about a third of it, which would retain. Um, itself uh, functionally as the entry to the house and uh, still um, kind of respect the fabric of uh, the streetscape. But the, um, the porch itself is currently set back almost 30 feet, but not quite from the front property line. Yes. And there's a gradual slope um, from the property line up to the house. Correct. And um, I think you said that there were other porch enclosures in the immediate vicinity? Yes, the uh, images that uh, Daniel had shown uh, prior to this one. Are those, um, are those all within the same block of North Sheridan? Yes. Yes, they are. Uh, whoever spoke, could, could you identify um, yourself for the record, please? I'm sorry, this is, uh, yeah, sorry, this is uh, Robert Burnett. Yes, the other photos of the other structures uh, with the enclosures, those are all within that same block. Uh, two are across the street and one is down on the same side of the street at the corner. Okay. And um, of those that you surveyed, are they um, are there any that are closer than 20 uh, than 30 feet to the front property line? It looked to me like there may have been structures that don't comply with the 30 foot setback. Uh, if we back up on yes, those photos. There, yeah. but that one is clearly uh, within 30 feet. Okay. And actually, there's a house across directly across the street from uh, the subject property that can't be more than 10 feet from the property line. Okay. Actually, this house is the one that's almost directly across the street from the, the subject property. I was thinking of the garage structure, the one on the corner, Rob. Yeah, on the, on the corner, yes. Mm hmm. I did a photo of that one, but yes, that's several doors over to the right of this one. Okay. But I'm, what I'm just trying to understand is that um, full compliance with a 30 foot setback is not, it, it's not uncharacteristic to have properties in the or structures in the area closer than 30 feet. Okay. Uh, I didn't have any other questions. I think, I think that, I mean, it is a really, uh, limited variance request. So I don't, I don't have any more specific questions. Um, Ms. Burton Falk or uh, Mr. Richardson? No additional questions. No questions. And, and just to clarify, you said that the, um, the request isn't to enclose the full porch, but about two thirds of it? That is correct. Okay, all right. This, this, is, this is Jonathan Elmer, I'm one of the owners. I would just mention uh, briefly, if I may, uh, for the record, that we've spoken with the neighbors on either side of the house and across the street as well, uh, all of whom are, are supportive of the, the plans as depicted. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Elmer. We appreciate that um, effort to reach out to your neighbors as well. Um, but with, are there any, uh, anybody attending who would like to participate in this matter? There's none, Madam Chief. I'm not seeing any. All right. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Close, close the record for North Sheridan. And 
move on to um, zone case 32 of 2022 for 3646 California Avenue. Um, the applicant is identified as Randy Jacoby and the owners are William Goodrich and Beth Lazera. Do we have representatives from the owners? Yes. Uh, Dan Kunz on behalf of the owners. Okay. Um, Mr. Kunz, are you your counsel for the owners then? Yes. Okay. And I'll, and I'll, um, I can be, I can begin to, uh, with me. I have a, the project manager from MDM surveyors and engineers. Uh, her name is Randy Giacobbe. And I also have, uh, Mr. Goodrich, who's the, okay. um, of the property. Okay. Thank you. And, um, I just, are they with you physically? Uh, no, they, they are on. Okay. The, we just, yeah. just want to make sure where everybody is so that we can swear everybody in. Sure. Now I, I do not know if they, um, have signed on yet, but uh, we have Mr. Goodrich is here, and I see MDM. Is the MDM would be um, Ms. Giacobbe? I believe so. Okay. If we could admit those two and then as panelists, and then I'll ask everybody, including council, um, if you swear or affirm that the information that you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. And I think we just need MDM. There we go. All right. If MDM LLC could unmute yourself and swear in for the record, we'd appreciate it. Yes, I'm here. Okay. And you, and, and you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shepke, could you read the case in, please? This is case 32 of 2022 for 3646 California Avenue. The application is to obtain occupancy for an existing seven stall service parking lot situated between Massachusetts and California Avenues. And they're seeking a special exception from 914.07.g.2a for uh, offsite parking. Okay. So Mr. Kuntz, do you wanna lead us through what's being proposed here? Yes, there, thank you so much. Is there a, a, a photograph or anything other than a site plan that would give us a context of where we're talking about here? Yes, there is. There's several uh, photographs. Maybe um, if we can um, flip through, those are the letters. Here we go. Uh, these, are, these depict the signs that were posted, but you can see this uh, vacant lot. Uh, where the um, the parking lot is going to be going? And it, well, uh, I, I, the the is the the parking lot um, is it is it intended for commercial use? Is it an open surface lot, or is it um, intended to support residential uses? I mean, what what for what is the parking being proposed? Well, it's proposed for a existing uh, law office. Um, and I'll go through my my little uh, uh, narrative if if you don't well, mind. Well, it, it just helps us narrative. to set the context to understand your narrative. So I I'm, right. I'm, it's a special exception for parking on a different lot than the primary use. Mm -hmm. um, pursuant to the section nine one four point zero seven point g point two subsection a. We know it well. <laughs> so my name is Daniel Kunz. I'm here representing the property owners, William Goodrich and Beth Lazera, who are seeking a special exception for parking on a different lot for workers at the law office, uh, which is one property away. Uh, we have here with us Randy Giacobbe, a project manager with MDM surveys and engineers in the event that there are any uh, questions with respect to the drawings, as well as Mr. Goodrich, who is the owner of, of both of the properties um, and he's very, very fam familiar with the neighborhood. So this property is located in the local neighborhood commercial uh, district, and it's in the Brighton Heights area of the city of Pittsburgh. Now, Mr. Goodrich has a law office at 3634 California Avenue, and he is requesting a special exception to construct a seven parking space lot on 3646 
California Avenue, uh, which is currently a vacant lot. And there's not a, a lot existing there. I think that had been mentioned. Do, do we um, know the, anything uh, about the prior use of this particular lot? I mean, and, and I, I think it would be helpful. It, it, I mean, from the photo that we're seeing, it looks like a residential neighborhood, but it's in an LNC district. So are there um, other photos that would give us a context of where we're talking about? I mean, I understand if there's a law office, a, 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 a property away, that it's not purely residential. So is there something that sets right. that context for us? I, yeah. I'm looking at one. So I believe that they had been submitted. If we cannot find it as we no, go no, through No, no, it's just here, a matter I, of moving through the photographs. If you if you direct us through what um, was submitted. There we go, that might help. Uh, okay, sure. well, that's this is, this is the um, the street and this is depicting, this is showing all of the, um, all of the parking that's taking place currently on the street. Okay, no, no, that, that's actually really helpful. So we're understanding okay. this is a, 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 um, a California Avenue LNC district with the right. various uses that would be permitted in the LNC district. The property is in the LNC district. And I'm assuming that you're presenting evidence that it's within a thousand feet of the use that, that is to support that it is to support, which would be the law office. Approximately 40 feet away. Okay. So it is within that thousand feet. And it's under the same ownership as the parcel that it's supposed to support? That is correct. Okay. And primarily the parking will be for uh, office workers at the law firm who currently utilize the, the street. Uh, Mr. Goodrich has a handicapped parking uh, that is located directly adjacent to the law office, which which is on a on a different lot than the one we're proposing. Uh, drawings have been uh, submitted and approvals from the Department of Mobility have already been obtained. I was the next I was going to ask is if has this been through a DOMI approval, um, and it because the, it is a new surface parking. Um, there are uh, requirements in terms of landscaping and screening and curb cuts and stuff. Um, it, the only relief that's being requested here, it's not for the parking lot use per se, but to allow this special exception for offsite parking. So that leads me to presume that there is no other relief that's being requested for the actual parking lot use. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Okay, so it, it's in terms of the special exception criteria, um, I think we've hit them all except the report from the planning director, which the zoning board is to request if it finds it necessary. So that is not the applicant's burden to um, tick that box in terms of special exception criteria. Um, it, are there, are there um, I, I noticed in the materials that um, there are letters from community groups and others. Could you explain briefly what those are? Uh, sure. Um, there are various letters of support submitted uh, from the Brighton Heights Citizens Federation. And uh, Mr. Goodrich, uh, do you want to maybe elaborate on uh, who you've who have you spoken with and the discussions that you've had uh, in sure. regards to this? Sure. Uh, the the Is location. If you could just introduce yourself for the record. Sure, my name is William F. Goodrich. I'm the property owner and I'm requesting uh, the relief in this matter. Uh, I have a, a law firm, Goodrich and Geis, located at 3634 California Avenue. Uh, and the location of this is uh, directly across from uh, Tom Friday's Market and a significant number of businesses along the line. The California Cycle Shop, the uh, pizza shop there, our, my, my father's pizza shop, uh, there's a coffee shop there also. There is a dog groomer shop there also. There's a small uh, uh, barber shop there also. And uh, I had gone to the Brighton Heights Citizens Federation and had uh, pro pro proposed my uh, use of this property. The idea being is to take up to seven vehicles off of the parking area in order to allocate those to the businesses along the front. Uh, it becomes a very congested uh, area uh, 
probably starting anywhere from 7.30 on in the morning because of the cycle shop has a significant number of people coming over in the morning uh, throughout the day. I think they conduct up to 15 different sessions there during the day. The butcher shop, Tom Friday's Market, has been there for 50 years and is uh, probably uh, one of the busiest small markets I've ever seen. There is a well, space- just hang, hang on, Mr. Goodrich. Just just so that I understand, I, I understand um, the issues of of neighborhood parking congestion. But um, the parking lot proposed. It, you, are you saying that you're intending to make it available in off hours for the other uses, or no? I'm, no, I'm not. No, this is for my employees. Okay. All right. That that like I like I said, but your your proposal would alleviate the general street parking issues by taking your employees parking off the street. Correct. Correct. Okay. That would thank you. Uh, uh, over the course of time since I moved over here, my office staff has increased. I have 11 employees in the building at any one point in time. And as such, uh, the spillover is onto the street and it takes up parking for the eight to 10 hours that people are there at the office and therefore eliminates the opportunity for the merchants to utilize the property. Uh, this would be and is supported by all of the merchants uh, along the street there because it would all allocate uh, additional parking for their businesses uh, all throughout the, the time period they would be there. The parking is, uh, it's literally uh, about 43 feet away from my driveway. Uh, and it, uh, I spoke to my neighbor in between, Mr. Christopher Moboto. Uh, I, he and I have had very cordial relationship over the last uh, 10 years that I've been here. Uh, and he has voiced no objections whatsoever, at least to me, uh, in our conversations, uh, the lot would, uh, again, free up seven spaces on the street. Uh, also, whenever I'm having any kind of depositions or meetings at my office, there are additional cl uh, clients who would come and park on the street. This way, I would be able to bring them into my uh, lot adjacent to the building and, again, keep cars off of the street. Uh, for thank, the thank, I think that makes sense. But um, I... Like I said, I just wanted to clarify that the intent is for offsite parking for your use, and there may, there there will be ancillary benefits um, to the the general neighbor. The one question, just in terms of history of the site, do we know whether um, had, had, was there a structure previously on this site, or yes. has been vacant for? Yes, when I moved into the neighborhood twenty years ago, there was a single family dwelling on the, on the house. Uh, and there were curb cuts coming in off of California Avenue onto the property and actually an exit onto uh, the street behind it uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was a driveway that ran all the way up and down. The house fell into disrepair. Uh, the house then uh, became uh, subject to a fire. And ultimately, the house was uh, torn down and condemned by the city. Uh, the, so, so I, I like I said, it, but the, the fact that there had been a curb cut there to support another use is is awful helpful yes. for us to understand. Okay, but like I said, I think our our um, the our agenda item is the request for the special exception for offsite parking, and I think we um, have heard evidence with respect to all the special exception criteria. I didn't have any other questions, but um, Ms. Burton Falk or Mr. Richardson. <coughs> No additional questions. Okay. I have no questions. And do we have anybody on the line who's um, intending to testify in this matter or would like to testify in this matter? There is none, Madam Chair. I see no hands raised either. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will accept all the exhibits that are presented. I think they, um, again, tick all the boxes in terms of the special exception criteria. So we will. Um, issue our decision accordingly. And thank you for your presentation this morning. Thank you very so much. much. All right, we're going to move on to the next matter. Um, the next matter identified on the record is zone case 37 of 2022 for Hayes Run, which was a proposed subdivision. As I understand it, um, the project has been reconfigured so that no variances are being requested. So the application has been withdrawn. Is that correct, Mr. Shepke? Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay, so that puts us back on time. So we're going to move to the 10 o'clock hearing. 
uh, which is zone case 53 of 2022 uh, for 320 Cedarhurst Street, parcels M 15M 9899, 102, 103, 104, 126, 127, and 131. We'll just call this Cedarhurst Street. Um, the applicant is identified as Thomas Swisher and the owner is the Belsuver Con Consensus Group. Do we have representatives from the applicant? Who is here on behalf of the applicant for um, Cedarhurst Street? I'm sorry, um, uh, Madam Chairman, this is Kevin McKeegan with Meyer Ankovic and Scott. I'm representing uh, the developer uh, in this case. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I'd probably like to introduce some witnesses just to make sure they're on uh, the- uh, That's, Thank you, Mr. McKeegan for speaking up. And if you could identify the witnesses that you are sure. anticipating, that would be helpful. And, and it's important because actually we're in probably three different counties at this point. so. Uh, um, controlling this might be a little bit difficult. Anyway, um, uh, with me today and making a presentation in this case will be uh, Mr. Andy Haynes, H-A-I-N-E-S, uh, from the Gatesburg Road Development Company. Uh, Karen Welsh, W-E-L-S-H. Uh, she is one of the project architects. Uh, Tom Swisher uh, from Farringer, McCarty and Gray. Uh, he filed the application, but they are the uh, project engineers. Uh, and hopefully on as well is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, uh, I'm, hopefully yeah, I'm just well. looking through our list of <laughs> attendees and okay. making sure that they're they're all here so far. We have Tom Swisher okay. with Brian Almeter. Yep. Uh, and we should also have Jennifer Cash Wade from the Beltsuver Consensus Group. Uh, I'm hoping Jennifer is on. Um, and last but certainly not least, after we make our presentation, I understand that Councilman Krauss uh, would like to uh, address the board on this as well. Okay, we have Councilman, we have all of those people except Jennifer, I think. No, we have Jenny Easton. There we go. All right, so if we could admit those individuals as uh, panelists. We have... Andrew Haynes, Jenny Easton, Karen Welsh, and Tom Swisher and Brian Almeter. All right, getting everybody in the room. Um, I ask everybody to unmute yourself for a moment and be sworn in. And if each of you would swear or affirm that the information that you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Okay. And Daniel, could you read the case in, please? This is zone case 53 of 2022 for 320 Cedarhurst Street. The application is to change into multi-unit apartments and site work to add parking area. Existing building includes 24 units. Building addition includes 12 units and two duplex, two, two duplexes, which include four units. They're requesting a variance from 911.02 uh, to change from two unit residential to multi unit residential, and a variance from 912.04.a. A minimum 15 foot front setback is required for a parking space. Okay. Mr. Keith McKeegan, I trust that you are going to make perfect sense of that um, request we, is identified. So. We, we are certainly going to make a good effort. Thank you. So uh, if Daniel could go, uh, just for purposes of the record, if he could go to the next slide, please, um, so that we can verify on the record that the property was properly posted uh, pursuant to uh, uh, the city code requirements. So uh, as I uh, began earlier, I'm here today on behalf of Gatesburg Road Development. Uh, Gatesburg Road Development is um, an affiliate of SNA Homes, um, a developer of um, uh, affordable and other types of housing projects uh, here and in other parts of Pennsylvania. Um, Gatesburg has been working now for almost nine months uh, with the Beltsuver Consensus Group, uh, which we're gonna refer to by their uh, initials, BCG. Uh, and the city of Pittsburgh on a project to adaptively reuse uh, the former Beltsuver Elementary School uh, at 320 uh, Cedar St Cedarhurst Street. 
Uh, and Daniel, if we could just go to the next slide to orient the board. Um, this is a copy of the uh, zoning map sort of pulled out uh, from the neighborhood so that the board appreciates that this site uh, is um, uh, smack dab in the middle uh, of the Beltsuver neighborhood. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the school site is uh, outlined in red uh, on this more close-up view of the zoning uh, uh, district. Uh, it is an R2 uh, high-density district. Uh, the school, uh, as you might imagine, is at the very heart of the neighborhood, at the heart of the community. Um, unfortunately, uh, the school has been vacant now for almost 18 years, uh, since June of uh, 2004. Uh, Gatesburg involvement um, uh, came about uh, because it responded to an RFQ uh, from BCG and the Urban Redevelopment Authority uh, last uh, summer. Uh, Gatesburg was selected to pursue redevelopment of the school building uh, because its vision uh, for the reuse of this school uh, aligned with that of BCG's. If this project goes forward, uh, the property as a whole would be developed uh, to contain 40 uh, senior housing affordable development uh, dwelling units. Um, a total of 36 uh, would be uh, in the existing school building plus an addition that would be added to it. So uh, 24 units in the existing school building, 12 in an addition. Uh, there would be four units in two duplex type dwellings uh, that would be erected uh, behind, the, uh, behind the school building itself. So uh, if, if you could pause, Mr. McKeegan, just sure. um, to orient a little bit, uh, the school, because the number of parcels were identified in the application, um, is the, it, and it's hard to read from, um, like, you'd have to enlarge a whole lot farther yep. for me to see this, but um, the school itself is that one large parcel? Um, that, that's and, correct. And, and actually, um, and I'm not sure, it's a very fair question. I'm not sure any of our other exhibits will help you with that, but uh, perhaps, um, Daniel, if you could flip ahead to the slide marked parcel ownership, it's towards the end. Oh, of there we go. Go back, go back. Keep, go back. Keep, keep going. Uh, okay, so that's an outline of the whole area. Okay. Uh, the school building itself, which is the um, uh, it's to the left of the area that's outlined in yellow, that parcel and most of the property around it is owned by BCG, titled in BCG. Uh, there are a few sliver parcels uh, to the right uh, that eventually will be incorporated uh, into the project site that are currently owned by the city of Pittsburgh. So that's how the URA got involved with this. Okay, so, but had, and again, arguably, if schools and school structures had not been permitted um, by right in, residential district, you would be making an argument that this is the change of a non-conforming use and a non-conforming structure um, in a residential neighborhood. Correct. So, but because it is a permitted use, it's a variance, but right. I'm just trying to understand what, um, what parcels had been devoted to the um, school use and the school structure um, prior to this application. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that question fully because we haven't actually gone back through the, the title for the various uh, blocks and lot. But I think, uh, again, Daniel, if you could flip ahead to the slide mark parcel ownership. Uh, back, 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 back. There you go. Stop there. Uh, the, okay. the part. The parcels outlined uh, in yellow on this um, uh, on this graphic are owned by BCG okay. and were acquired by BCG after the school was closed. OK, so I, I hate I hate to make a presumption, but I'm, I'm going to assume that those were the parcels involved in the school use. The okay. other parcels there are either, um, public uh, paper streets that are going to need to be vacated or uh, actually owned by the city of Pittsburgh. Okay, thank you. And the, um, so the green hash, is that the, um, a paper street or? Correct, that's right. Okay. That, that actually right. Run, runs underneath the existing school building. Don't ask me. <laughs> I, 
Okay, I'm not 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 going to get into that, but uh, Thank you. I, I, I got you off track. So if you could uh, go sure. back to what's being proposed here. Okay, so uh, if we could go back this uh, quickly to whatever slide we left this with, uh, that one's fine. So in addition uh, to the um, uh, uh, housing units that are going to be incorporated into the school building, the addition, the duplexes, um, there also will be. A meeting room um, as part of the uh, addition to the school uh, building. Uh, the exact functions of that meeting room haven't quite yet been worked out yet, but it's anticipated uh, that that would also support some of the community outreach efforts by BCG. Um, it's important for the board to understand that uh, this building really is, is part of the fabric of Beltsuver. Uh, the project, if it goes forward, is going to be named for Dr. Lewis A. Vinson. Um, who was a widely respected and well-known principal of the school uh, when it was opened. Um, so the reason we're here today, getting to the crux of the matter, is that uh, the planning for this project is far from complete. But if it's to move forward at all, um, it's important that Gatesburg be able to uh, apply and use uh, Pennsylvania low-income housing tax credits uh, as part of the uh, financing uh, for this project. Uh, and in order to get in line, so to speak, for those credits, uh, Gatesburg uh, has to satisfy a Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency requirement that the use is one allowed by the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the R2H zoning district um, doesn't permit a development of this type, uh, hence the necessity for a variance at this stage uh, in the process. So uh, just so everybody understands, this is uh, a first step. It's probably by no means the last step, but it's a very important one. Uh, because if we uh, if the project isn't able to get that uh, those tax credits, it uh, likely would not move forward. So let me pause at this point and see if the board has any questions for me, and then I'm going to start directing some questions to Mr. Haynes. And again, so I, I I think I understand generally, um, but I'm curious the, the because there's a distinction between the existing school structure and addition and two duplexes. It seems like the duplexes would be consistent with the R2H um, zoning designation. Um, That's correct. So uh, I think it's really um, how you arrived at the number of 24 and how the um, building addition for 12 uh, would also be consistent with the density that's already permitted in the district. And, and we'll address that okay. uh, later on in terms of some testimony from Mr. Swisher. In any event, if I can ask, uh, Mr. Haynes, are you able to hear me at this point? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Hey, Andy, uh, just for the record, uh, would you please uh, give your name and address and briefly describe uh, your role uh, with Gatesburg and with this project? Uh, my name is Andrew Haynes. I'm with Gatesburg Road Development at 2121 Old Gatesburg Road, State College, Pennsylvania, 16803. I'm an executive vice president with the company. And we are the okay. developer uh, of the property. Thank you, Andy. Uh, could you briefly describe uh, your personal experience with uh, real estate development? Uh, I have been involved in community development and affordable housing for almost 30 years. I have a master's in city and regional planning from Ohio State University. Uh, during my time at graduate school, I started working in affordable housing and have been with uh, Gatesburg Road SNA Homes now for 22 years. I've developed okay. uh, 32 low income housing tax credit properties. And have any of those projects been in the Pittsburgh area? Uh, yes, we have done eight in the Pittsburgh area and five in the city, uh, or in the actual city, East Liberty, Homewood, uh, Garfield. And then we, about eight years ago, we developed the Federal Hill Project on Federal Street on the north side, where we built and sold 44 for sale homes that were both affordable and market rate. So I'm very familiar with the city. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, could you uh, describe for the board a little bit about, about how you were selected to be the uh, developer for this project? Uh, in May of 2021, uh, a request for qualifications was due to the URA and BCG. Um, we, in partnership with Fulani Development, a minority uh, business uh, 
out of the city, we submitted a, a proposal to redevelop the property into senior housing, and then also do a future development of scattered site lease purchase surrounding the neighborhood. And we were chosen after a couple interviews as the develop as the developer. And when you say you were chosen, you were chosen by BCG, correct? Correct. We met with a, a group, a, a committee of the BCG board that focuses on the redevelopment of this school, and they chose us as the development partner with them. And, and based upon that process, uh, what understandings did you learn about what BCG was looking um, uh, for the ultimate use of this property? What, what was their goal here? Well, th this is clearly a community-driven process. This is a community group that viewed this school as a, a main vocal point of their community. They wanted to preserve the property. Uh, they wanted to continue it as a residential use. Um, and they are have been actually went out and purchased the property, then received foundation money to stabilize the property so it would not fall into further disrepair. Okay. Um, and uh, Daniel, could we go to the next slide, please? It should be labeled enlargement of school parcel. Thank you. So, uh, Andy, I'm going to assume that as part of this process, you've visited the school building. Could you briefly describe it? Um, number of rooms, floors, its building area, so those sure. details. Um, the school was built in 1905. Um, it's approximately 56, 700 square feet. It's about a, it's a three-story building with one story below grade. Um, the, originally, the building had a, a 42 rooms. We will be consolidating or subdividing those rooms to create 43 rooms, but we'll have 24 units in the existing school. Um, we are adding a 20,000 square foot addition to add another 12 units uh, to support the development. Okay, um, so based upon your knowledge of the school building itself, as well as uh, your experience in real estate, uh, in your opinion, is this building suitable uh, for a single family or duplex type use? No, it is not. Uh, it is in a community where the, A, the market values for for sale house would not support um, the development of these units into for sale units. Um, it is also the community's desire to maintain the property as is. Um, so there are there are definitely economic and pragmatic uh, challenges to putting this into the current zoning it is. And, and would one of those challenges be just the simple size of the building that it, it, that makes it extraordinarily difficult to just turn it into one or two uh, dwelling, dwelling units? Yeah, the, the, I mean, of that square footage, probably half of it is actually hallway space. Um, which makes it extremely problematic to lay out units when half of your building is all hallways. Um, okay. Also, um, you know, egress, ingress, you'd have to condo the property. Uh, there are extreme challenges to putting that use into this property. Okay. All right. Um, I have no other questions uh, for Mr. Haynes. Um, I don't know if the board wants me to keep going or if they have any questions for him. You're muted. I think we, I think you can move on, Mr. McKeegan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Karen Welsh, uh, are you able to hear me, please? I am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, again, uh, just for um, uh, starting this off, would you um, uh, state your name for the record and describe uh, your role with the project? My name is Karen Welsh. I'm a principal at Upstreet Architects, Inc., we have worked on many historic preservation and adaptive reuse projects and have a large portfolio of multifamily housing developments. Okay, um, so uh, we're gonna go through a series of slides now to, to kind of focus in on the school building. So uh, Daniel, could you uh, flip ahead please to the slide that's labeled existing conditions view and then we're gonna come back to some of the slides before that. Okay, so if we stop there, please. So um, uh, starting with this photograph, uh, Jenna or Karen, would you please uh, just you know describe a little bit about uh, the building uh, itself, uh, any architectural features it has, uh, its character, so to speak. The original 1905 school was designed by architect William Shaw. 
and a complimentary rear edition was designed in 1909 by Thomas Lloyd. It is in the classical revival style with a 19,250 square foot cruciform shaped footprint enclosing approximately 60,000 total square feet on three floors. The school sits on a plateau above the adjacent roads, making its corbelled bell tower even more prominent. And from the tower, the sound of ringing bells was projected to the community. Dominating the Cedarhurst elevation is a stone retaining wall and a monumental double staircase leading to a plaza. The gentler and shaded stair down to Sylvania Avenue also has significance as a primary entrance. The building is not ornate, but is handsome and well proportioned and well constructed. The okay. classical architect. I'm sorry. Okay. Please, we can keep going. Say, this is a this is a planning commission, so okay. we, we appreciate right. the architectural we, background, but would prefer to move on to the we, we, um, certainly we, being requested. I, I, sure. Uh, I, I knew you were going to ask that. So if we can just go to the next uh, slide, please, uh, Daniel. Oh. Okay. So. Um, so these are interior, if Karen, if you could just confirm, these are interior shots of the building as it currently exists, correct? A lot of hallway space. Correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and in your opinion, um, is, is the building overall in fairly good condition? Is it well-preserved? Yes, it is, um, uh, uh, watertight and secure, and we've had a structural report completed and the building is in sound condition. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, what's going to happen in the interior, uh, will the will the uh, if this project moves forward, will the stairwell and these hallways be preserved, uh, incorporated into the project? In other words, yes, they will be. Okay, so Daniel, if you would now flip back, please, a couple of slides uh, to the one that has historic Pittsburgh at the top. There we go. Right there. Thank you. So um, uh, this is kind of the meat of the, the, the uh, presentation, so to speak. Karen, is this building uh, protected in any way by the city of Pittsburgh? Yes, it is uh, protected by an agreement in 1999 between the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation, uh, which initiated a process um, where the Historic Review Commission uh, designated the building as architecturally significant, and it is a part of the city of Pittsburgh historic structures um, and is subject to city historic review commission approval. Okay. Now we're not gonna go into this at length, but uh, included in the materials are um, specific guidelines uh, that apply to um, uh, renovation of this building. Uh, uh, Daniel, you can just so the board understands they're part of the process flip forward place um, until I say stop. I understand our, our role is to be considering the use, not the Correct. structure. I understand. We appreciate this. We're not doing an HRC review. Uh, and we're not asking you to. However, uh, it's, Thank important, you. it's important to understand that the building is, is protected. It's subject to the HRC ordinance as well as these guidelines. Um, so Karen, uh, um, uh, in your opinion, based on these guidelines and your, under, and your understanding of the ordinance, uh, is it likely at all that the HRC would approve a demolition of this building? No, I, in my opinion, uh, it would not meet the criteria established in the guidelines. Okay. Uh, and, those, and those criteria include a consideration by the HRC of the condition of the building, correct? Correct. Structural condition, okay. feasibility, and character. And, and given that this building is in good condition, then it's, it's one that uh, the HRC uh, presumably would want to preserve. Correct. Okay. All right. So now if we can just uh, move ahead to the actual proposal. Uh, and Daniel, I think, unfortunately, you may have to go back a slide or two. All right. So uh, there you go. So this is a rendering of the uh, building with the addition. Um, um, and this is um, really what we're proposing in terms of redevelopment of the site. Karen? Correct, yes. Okay, um, uh, and, this, and as far as you know, uh, although these haven't been vetted yet by the city, uh, the intent here is to uh, conform or confirm, conform, excuse me, uh, the exterior changes to the building and the addition 
uh, to the historic guidelines, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I don't have any other questions for uh, Karen. Uh, so again, I'd invite the board uh, if they choose to, to address some questions our way. Well, just again, in terms of what the board is considering with respect to the addition, um, that the addition is intended for 12 more units than would be in the um, main building. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And, and that okay. do, do, is, I'm assuming that there's a site plan in here that shows um, where on the property those units would go. I mean, I, like yes, what part of what part of the, the the footprint? Where where is the addition in terms okay. of this, uh, the, the site the, plan? The addition is going to be okay. If you can skip ahead to the concept plan, uh, Daniel, and then we will ask Mr. Swisher some questions, and I think hopefully this will become clear. There we go. Wait, there. Okay. okay. There you go. Con That's what I want to see. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, Unless there are questions for Karen, if I can just move ahead to Mr. Swisher quickly, please. I don't think we have too much more at this point. That would be great, thank you. Okay, okay. Tom, can you hear me, please? Tom, Brian Allmeter. We have um, Mr. Swisher, Mr. Allmeter are currently listed as attendees. We might have to promote them to panelists and they would have to accept if, the, that invitation. If you would, please, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Apologize. Beyond, beyond my control, so we'll try to get them into the room here. Mariam, can you do that? The Tom Swisher and Brian Almeter are the last ones on the attendees list, and they have to accept as panelists. There they come. All right. All right. So, so now, <laughs> wait a second. Let 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 one of them identify themselves. Okay. If they could, Mr. Swisher, or Mr. Almeter, go off mute. There we go. Hi, this is Tom Swisher. I'm a landscape architect with Farringer McCarty Gray. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Tom, I just want to uh, just again to be sure we don't uh, mess something up here. Uh, you did you did uh, swear yourself in when uh, the oath was read earlier. I, I um, did, yes. notwithstanding the fact. Okay, Thank great. You, Thank Mr. you, Mr. McKeegan, okay. for that clarification. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so um, uh, let's go. Let's again skip ahead very quickly, Tom, uh, to a question that was asked earlier. Um, although it's unlikely that this school building would ever be demolished, uh, if it were demolished, do you know how many um, uh, duplex type or, or two unit type units might be uh, possible of construction on this site? Yes, if we were to utilize all nine parcels in the vacated streets, uh, we would, by zoning, we would be able to fit over 44 units on the site. Uh, so more than more than the 44 that are proposed in this uh, uh, concept, correct? It's actually we only have 40 proposed at this time, but yes. 40. I'm only... sorry. Yeah. I apologize. I, mis I misunderstood. Yes. Yeah, so we so we're, we're proposing 40, and uh, you 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 from your review of the site uh, and the zoning code, we could get at least 44 units on the property. That's correct. Okay. All right, so now I wanna turn uh, finally to the question regarding the uh, disabled person parking space. Uh, so um, Daniel, if you could go to the slide uh, labeled uh, highlighted areas of required variance. I don't think we'll need any other slides to, there you go, thank you. There we go. All right, so um, uh, Tom, the handicapped parking space uh, is gonna, to be located uh, within that area that's outlined in blue on this drawing, correct? It's sort of the projection off the driveway? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, why was that site uh, uh, chosen for, for the handicapped parking space? Why, why is it really the best, best place for the, that space? Uh, the first floor of the addition is going to uh, relate to Cedarhurst, um, which is about nine feet lower than the parking lot that's proposed. Um, and we were trying to create the most ADA accessible route from a parking space to that front door of the addition. And by uh, basically because of the topography of the site, if we were just to have the parking space in the proposed parking lot, 
uh, someone would have to traverse about 100 lineal feet of ADA ramps to get down to that door. And by also by sliding this, clo the closer we get to the road, we can actually keep the entrance drive up to the proposed parking lot at, a, at the most minimal range possible. Um, if basically, the further we go into the site, the steeper the climb becomes up the access drive. Okay. Um, and and what just, sort just so I understand it, the, the variance being requested is for a setback from the um, front property line. Is that correct? But is it, yes, is it a request correct. to, it, on our agenda, it just tells us that the 15 foot is required. What you're saying is that the space would go up to the property line. Um, actually, the um, parking space is the face of the curb is about five feet from the right of way, and the back of the curb is about four and a half feet from the right of way. We're 12 feet from the curb of the road. Okay. I just, I, I, I'd like to identify how much of a variance is being requested. Yeah, we roughly about 11 feet. You, you'd be set back 11 feet or you are requesting no, to I, be set, okay. I, th I think yeah, the variance we'll request 11 feet, otherwise, um, uh, in other words, we can't get 15 feet away from the right of way, I think is what. I, I understand. I'm just, like I said, I want to identify what relief is being requested. Yeah. So, thank you. All right, so Tom, um, uh, just again to, to make it clear on the record, um, when, when you talk about a topographic change and uh, ADA ramps, what sort of grade differentials are we talking about between where the proposed parking lot is located on, on this plan and the proposed location of the uh, space for disabled persons? Um, an elevation difference is, it's not completely finalized, but it's about seven to nine feet in difference. Okay, um, and is there a percentage change of any sort that you'd like to, um, you know, is it eight percent grade, five percent grade? What sort of grade are we talking about in that in, a, in that context? Well, if we were to have someone traverse from the proposed parking lot uh, behind the building to the front of the building, it would the maximum grade we can go is eight point three three. That's why it would be about a hundred lineal feet of ramp to get down to the uh, front door. The proposed space that we have right now, we would be well under 5% going from the parking space to the front door. Um, the parking pad and the access aisle would be all under 2%. Okay, so this this makes it, uh, this location makes the space much, much more usable than for uh, a disabled person. Correct. Okay, so uh, last couple of questions. Uh, in terms of the location of this uh, space uh, within the front yard, um, what sort of um, uh, landscaping is currently envisioned? Um, uh, will this space be, um, uh, will it make a great impact, so to speak, on Cedarhurst Street? Um, the, um, there's proposed street trees, as you can see on the plan, as required by ordinance. Um, those will actually add some um, screening to the parking space. Um, we would like to keep the um, shrubbery between the parking space and the curb line as low as possible, um, basically to maintain better sight lines out, out along the driveway up on Cedarhurst. Um, we could put, um, we, we intend to place um, some shrubbery in front of the parking space. So that would, um, you know, screen the view from the one side. And as you're coming up, um, the, this, the driveway comes on, it comes off of a crest off of Cedarhurst. So, it's not like you're seeing this from every part along Cedarhurst. You're really only going to see it like right when you're at the entrance driveway because of the topography and it's, of Cedarhurst. And it, thank you. And it's going to sit somewhat above uh, the elevation of Cedarhurst to begin with, correct? Yes, uh, about a foot or so, foot or two. Yeah, okay. Just out of curiosity, right. would the um, landscaping be part of the consideration under the HRC guidelines? Uh, I don't believe so. I think the HRC is more concerned with the, the building structure, just, but we in can terms serve. of the screening and everything. I just wondered if that was part of their analysis, but you, you can say no, or I don't know, and we can move on. Uh, I don't know. Let's move on. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, so that's all I have, uh, in terms of, uh, testimony from, um, Mr. S Mr. Haynes, uh, the, uh, Karen or Tom. Um, I'd like to turn it over now, uh, if I could, to uh, Jennifer Cash-Wade from BCG. Uh, I don't 
intend to ask her any questions, but I know she would like to make uh, a statement to the board regarding the project. Sure, we'd, we'd be delighted to hear. If um, Ms. Wade could identify herself for the record. Yes, good morning. Jennifer Cash Wade. I am a member of the Beltsuver Consensus Group, BCG, a lifelong resident of Beltsuver. And my purpose in speaking to you this morning is to, um, to support what is going on, what all of the uh, testimony that you've heard today as it pertains to Re redeveloping the Beltsuber Elementary School into um, affordable senior living. We, uh, the residents of Beltsuber, this school has, as you've heard, been an integral part of our community. Many of the, uh, many of our board members, as well as residents of the community, have not only themselves gone to the school, but their children, and in some cases, such as mine, my grand, my oldest granddaughter actually went to this school. So the school it building itself, it, it holds so many warm memories. The reason uh, we chose to name it after Dr. Vincent is because he was the principal at the school for a number of years. He uh, transformed the school. He transformed the, uh, the children's um, eagerness to learn. He was just an integral part of the community along with several of his staff members. So we are looking forward to preserving the building, continuing to have it as a community asset, which is how we see it, a valuable community asset. We intend to work closely. We have been working closely with Gatesburg and Fulani Development Companies. We chose them because they have experience. Um, I myself, I'm a realtor and I'm also a strategy consultant for the Beltsuver Consensus Group. So I'm familiar with their work. And it was really an kind of an easy decision after our interview process. We have been meeting uh, bi-weekly with them to be uh, kept abreast of what's going on. We are, um, you know, having, uh, we're, we're part of a lot of the decision-making process that would have impact the community. So um, we're excited. The community is excited. We're in full support. We're actually, this evening, the BCG holds a community forum meeting every, uh, the fourth Thursday of every month, I'm sorry, the third Thursday of every month, and it's this evening, and our development team is coming to present the progress of this project to the community this evening. So we are hoping to be able to get over this first, um, I don't want to call it a hurdle, but we want to present to you and hope that you'll understand how important this project is to the community and how we ple how pleased we are to be working with Gatesburg and Fulani to bring it to fruition. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Wade. And I, I'm assuming that you, you would fully support the idea of, of the residential use um, and the, your position is that the residential use of the existing structure um, would not have any detrimental impact on the surrounding neighborhood and would actually enhance it. Absolutely. Okay. And there is a desire by many residents to um, be able to age in place in our own community. And no, so this is presenting that opportunity. No, no, no fighting for spaces. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much for your statement. And um, Mr. McKeegan, I, I see uh, Councilman Krause is on the line um, as well. If we could admit Councilman Krause. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Councilman Krause. Do you swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And good morning to members of the board as well. Uh, Madam Chair, I have uh, had the pleasure of appearing before the Zoning Board uh, numerous, numerous times over my now 15 years uh, serving as a councilman, but I have never appeared before you more enthusiastically in support of a project. The, uh, the, the revitalization of the Bell Hoover School um, is, is transformational for the Bell Hoover neighborhood. There is what I've learned uh, uh, 
from residents, generations of residents, that there is almost a, a spiritual connectivity uh, between this building and the community. And I have yet to meet a resident in uh, the neighborhood of Belts Hoover that does not have a story about this building, how they attended it, or their children attended it, or their grandchildren attended it, and what an impact it had on their lives. And so um, working with Ms. Wade, uh, working with the Belts Hoover Consensus Group, starting about five years ago now, uh, we uh, constructed a very uh, community up uh, process by which we uh, believe we could get the, the school to be revitalized. Uh, and so with the help of Heinz Endowment, uh, help with uh, the URA, the, uh, my office, uh, unwavering support for the project, uh, the Peduto administration, now into the Ganey administration, uh, we have uh, reached a point to where we are uh, before you asking for the variances that would be needed to, to allow this project to continue, for this building to be revitalized, um, and uh, to uh, see our, uh, our dream, if you will, that we have labored so intensively on uh, actually come to fruition. I, uh, again, I, I cannot, cannot stress the importance of the project to the uh, to the neighborhood uh, and my full, complete, and unwavering support to see this project come to uh, fruition. So, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning, Madam Chair. We 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 thank you for that testimony and um, impassioned support is always always welcome to hear. So, thank thank you for that. Um, thank you. Do we have others? Um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised as to other participants. And I should, Ms. Burton Falk or Mr. Richardson, any other questions for the applicant? No additional questions, Madam Chair. No questions. I, it, so um, for the applicant team, it, I, it, with a complicated or a, um, obviously there's an underlying legal theory involved um, and recognizing the, the time deadlines for PH, PHFA loans, uh, would it be possible for the development team to submit proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law for the board's consideration um, so that we identify the correct relief that's being requested and the legal theories that support it? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, and uh, I have discussed this with the client. Uh, if, um, we, we will submit those within the next two weeks. Uh, and um, we, we will, um, if, if you can submit those within the next two weeks, we will um, do our best to adhere to the 45 day deadline from today, not from when you submit, but obviously the more quickly you submit, the better. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So um, hearing uh, no others seeking to participate in this hearing, we will close the record. Thank you all for your participation. Yeah and move thank on to the last case of the day. Thank you, Thank you very much for your attention. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last case of the day is zone case 40 of 2022 for 312 Ritchie Avenue. The applicant is identified as Daniel Little and the owners, um, Adrian Walhona. Uh, yes, this is Daniel oh, no. Little. Okay, Mr. Little and do you anticipate others testifying with you this morning? Uh, yeah, I believe Adrian is here on the Zoom with us. There and we she have will... Adrian as well. Yes. So um, I'm going to ask you both, uh, Ms. Ms. Wolnoha, uh, if you could um, unmute yourself, and I'm going to ask you both if you each swear or affirm that the information you'll provide to the board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you. And Daniel, could you read the case in place? This is case 40 of 2022 for 312 Ritchie Avenue. The request is the use of a 10 foot, nine inch by 19 foot one car parking pad at the front of the single unit residence, which is located zero feet from the front and interior side setback. They're requesting a variance from 912.04.A. Uh, the requested front setback, the required front setback is 30 feet and zero feet is requested and a variance from 912.04.C. 
uh, the required setback is five feet and zero feet is requested. Okay, so um, Mr. Little, are you proceeding with the application here? Yeah, I will be doing the presentation today. Okay, and are you are you an architect or engineer or how are you related to this project? I'm the contractor for the project. Okay. And so just to give an, an overview here, we have the uh, site plan for the parcel. And um, I did a front porch renovation for um, Adrian. And I also did a, uh, uh, a parking pad and a sidewalk replacement. Uh, the, the sidewalk was the replacement, but the parking pad was added. And, um, you know, I went and applied for the permits in good faith but i unfortunately missed that i needed a curb cut for the parking pad so the you need to i mean the parking in front yards is not permitted so um you're proposing to transform the front yard into a parking pad when it's supposed to be a setback and that's that's already been done well part of the work has been done and um yes that was my mistake we made the um the improvements to make mobility for uh, Adrian's elderly father easily, uh, sorry, uh, improved his uh, ability to access the property and to also reduce the uh, uh, on-street parking uh, in the front of the well, house. Well, I, I, I mean, basically, it, is there any hardship that prevented compliance with the setback requirement? I mean, I, I, if, if everybody who wanted to have the convenience of their own parking space just went ahead and installed it, I mean, there, there's a prohibition against it. So I'm, I'm just like, I understand why the work was stopped because it's not permitted. So um, the variance of the, 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 the variances that are being requested require some showing of a hardship associated with the property, yes. not with the um, well. Not there, with there the is... convenience of the property owners, or I mean, yeah, I, I appreciate course. the concerns, but it there's supposed to be a hardship associated with the property, not yes. the individuals living there. And and so that hardship would be the fact that the uh, well, all of the properties built on this street have a very steep decline on the back of the property. So there's no access to the back of the property. And um, the, uh, the front of the park property is actually a lot of the buildings are within that 30 foot setback because of the back uh, not being accessible at all. And so that would be the hardship. Um, well, but that, that's not a unique hardship. That's a hardship that's shared by all of the parcels. I mean, that, sure. so um, if, I, I, again, you're, you're proposing to add value to one parcel at the expense of the neighboring parcels, because um, if there's this, if, you know, we get our own parking space, but nobody else does. Well, there's all, there's actually already several uh, different properties, and we have photos of those um, on the presentation that have off-street parking uh, within the setbacks. Uh, many of them are zero or near zero setbacks from the front and the side of the property, as is, um, you know, proposed here in this variance. Uh, and I would if, also just like to mention that um, in my property, is you, a, excuse me, could you identify yourself for the record? I'm sorry, this is Adrian Wanaha, the property owner at 312 Ritchie. Um, when I purchased my home, the situation that was presented was that there was off street parking, and that was also in my assessment. And if you take a look at the property before um, the work that we did and after, there were patches of concrete through the yard, um, some a little wider, some narrower, and some isolated. So in order to you know, fix and refurbish my sidewalks for accessibility and safety, um, we did the front sidewalk, which was um, the concrete mixed with rocks. So not a flat surface, I mean, relatively shallow as a sidewalk, and there was grass that had been grown at one part of it. So when we redid the sidewalks um, to make them safe, smooth, um, and wide enough, the front sidewalk and then the side sidewalk, um, extending the side sidewalk appropriately forward, um, the side of the home and the front of the home are then 
um, covered in concrete because those were the existing sidewalks. And my assumption being the original parking pad was the large slab of concrete that was just in the yard. Um, so Is there we'll any curb cut that would um, reflect that the prior use for parking? Yes, so there actually is a dip in the curb. Um, well, is there a formal curb cut is my question. I mean, not so whether there, somebody drove up over the sidewalk or whether there's a, a, a formal curb cut. Right, so there really isn't much of a curb period. In the one location, there's a, a tiny bit of worn down concrete that was past my sidewalk. Um, do we, I, I, we're looking at a site plan, but it might be helpful to see the, the property itself. Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually a photo of the uh, work as it currently stands. Uh, and you can see the section of the curb that Adrian was referring to right there in the front. Um, it's, it's set down onto the, uh, the actual existing street. And that was not changed with the concrete work that uh, we had put in. And I also have before photos uh, further on down in the presentation. Uh, yeah, so this is what the yard looked like before the work was done. And you can see what uh, Adrian was referring to earlier. Um, are there, have you, have you made application to um, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure for a formal curb cut approval? Yes, I have. Definitely. Yeah, and I've submitted that plan to um, the de Department of Mobility and they've uh, let me know that pending the approval from uh, the zoning variants, uh, I, we can go ahead with the additional work to bring it into compliance for DOMI. Um, you had said that there are other parcels in the immediate vicinity that um, have uh, front yard parking. Yeah. Do you have it, photos of those? Yes, they'll be further down in the presentation. Uh, specifically, it's 114 and 116 Ritchie Avenue. Uh, I have aerial photos right here. You can see the uh, two parcels I'm referring to. One has the red car in front and then immediately to the right, uh, 114 and 116. Uh, and then if you go down to the next slide, you can see the, um, the parking pads that I'm referring to. But those are on the side. Those aren't in front of the house. Yeah, and the, uh, the dome- and Those permit. are set back um, at least as far as the house. Yeah, and if you go to the uh, the original site plan, the additional work, so the, the work that is photographed here is not up to the compliance of what Domi will say. You can see there that it actually goes up into the side of the house next to the setback for where the porch is. Um, that's going to be the additional work that will be done to bring it into compliance. So the... <sighs> Are you saying that the this, the parking space proposed would be in line with the house, not um, just concrete in front of the house? Yeah, it'll it'll extend. If you can zoom in there, it'll extend back to the front line of the house there. So the car will be up, uh, you know, partially next to okay. the uh, front porch. Yeah, okay. and we also have uh, a. Uh, uh, a written letter of support from the neighbor on that side of the property, 314. And we also have uh, a written letter of support in this presentation from uh, 301, I believe it is, across the street. And we also have verbal confirmation from 308, who is on the opposite side of uh, where the parking pad will be uh, to the left of this uh, site plan. And uh, I, I believe Adrian has spoken to several of her neighbors, and they're all very much in support of uh, this variance. All right. Um, it's challenging for the board when um, it, it is, a, when forgiveness is requested instead of initial approval. Yeah, of, of course. Oh. And, and um, you know, I, we in good faith tried to apply for all of the permits. And, and I know that that was my mistake by, by missing the curb cut. Um, and this was something that was just, you know, something that we missed. And, and so I really apologize for that. I know it's, it's, uh, inconvenient for the board to have to deal with that. Okay. Um, I didn't have any other questions. Did, um, Ms. Burton-Falk or Mr. Richardson, any questions from the applicant? No additional questions, Madam Chair. No questions. And do we have any other participants who would like to, um, weigh in on this application. 
Um, hi, yes, good morning. My name is I, Jenny Easton. Sorry, I'm just, I'm seeing. Okay, there we are. Uh, Ms. Easton, could you identify yourself for the record, please? Sure, I live across the street from the subject property at 309 Ritchie. And your position with respect to what's being requested? Um, well, I apologize sincerely to Adrian for having to object. You are a wonderful neighbor and I hate to cause you trouble. Um, so I'm a professional planning and zoning consultant by trade, but my concern with this application is primarily as one of the many pedestrians to whom the walkability of the street is really important. Um, I wanna note that the property does not appear to have been posted with notice at any point as required. Um, last fall, as Daniel said, a portion of the front yard was paved without approval and a curb cut made in order to store a vehicle in the front yard. So this had the effect of permanently privatizing a stretch of curb for personal use, which seemed unnecessary because ample street parking is always available less than 100 feet away. Um, it would appear that the application proposes expanding that paved area further so that more than half the property's frontage is concrete. Um, no other home on the street has a parking pad in front of a home. Some do have driveways that allow parking behind the setback. Surface parking in front of the home is inconsistent with our street's built environment where setbacks are mostly well landscaped green space. Many lots are narrow. My lot is narrow. It's not a condition unique to the subject property. And most importantly, there's no hardship that would warrant the variance. The Commonwealth Court ruled in a similar case back in 2017 that a narrow side yard does not amount to an unnecessary hardship that would justify a variance for a parking space within the front yard setback. Maximizing the convenience of personal car storage is not a more important public goal than maintaining the standards the city adopted for a high quality built environment. Um, in a briefing last year to Planning Commission, DCP noted that in the prior five years, the ZBA had heard 14 requests regarding variances for front yard parking pads. The board denied 10 of 14, more than two thirds of those, and I would respectfully encourage you to deny this application as well. Thank you. We, we do um, view each property as being unique, but um, thank you for bringing the statistics about front yard parking to our attention. Um, okay, um, did the applicant want to respond to the um, objection that was raised? I do just briefly. So the concrete work for the sidewalks needed to be done regardless. So the sidewalk in the front of my home, I brought into alignment with the sidewalks that border my home to actually make the sidewalk larger, wider, more accessible and more safe. Um, that concrete is going to be there for the sidewalks. They needed to be repaired and to be brought into safe condition. So that concrete will be there. To Daniel's point, when we discovered, um, we did have permits posted on the door when we discovered that it was a curb cut. Um, we had, there's really not a curb there. So we had had a misunderstanding about that. When we discovered that we stopped work. The intention would be to pull to the side of the home, not to be parked in front of the home. Um, so that area in the front would be raised beds for planting, um, as was planned when we did the sidewalk safety and widening um, so that we have still green space and that we have no more accessible, wide, usable sidewalk for pedestrians and for folks who are trying to enter homes, um, including, you know, this point became really salient when, you know, my dad began living with me and he had mobility impairments. So we widened the steps, we lowered the step grade, and we did all of that sidewalk work to make sure that it is more safe and accessible. Um, thank you for that. And I, again, I would encourage you both to continue to have good relations in the neighborhood despite having objections um, to different work. So, um, thank you all for participating. You've given us. Um, different issues to consider and we will close the record, um, but the board has uh, 45 days to issue a decision and we try to be more timely than that. So thank yeah. you all for being here this morning. We're going to close um, for today.